ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the comedian, Paul F. Tompkins. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to me. I am... My name is Paul F. Tompkins, and I do Paul F. Tompkins-based comedy. If you're not familiar with me, I don't blame you. I'm just getting to know myself. <laughs> One thing you must know about me is that I am a married man, which to me is a miraculous fact. I never thought that I would be married. Well, I, I, like not in my lifetime. <laughs> Maybe my children, my children's children, they'd see me married. But I'm very surprised and very delighted because I was uh, what you would call a late bloomer. It took me a while to get my personal act together because I am from a generation that had more choices than previous generations. And I think that delayed maturing. Like my father's generation, the greatest generation, he fought in World War II. Here's how old that guy is. He's dead. <laughs> right? That's as old as it gets. This generation, very different. Not a lot of choices. Here were the choices that you had. What everybody else was doing. The end. <laughs> it was very simple. If there was a war, you enlisted in it. No questions asked. You came home, you got a job that you hated. Why? Because no one's going to marry you if you don't have a job. Why get married? So someone will cook for you. Sustenance. <laughs> you have children to perpetuate the cycle of misery. <laughs> You retire at 50, you look like you're 80. <laughs> and over all of everything, from the moment you were born to the day you are laid into the ground, if you have a feeling about something, you just bottle that up. <laughs> you don't say nothing to nobody. <laughs> Your only outlet being later in life saying casually racist things at the dinner table and in front of your children's friends. <laughs> that was what you got to do. So for me, it was different, and I had a lot of trouble with emotional relationships, any kind of relationship. Now for me, because there was not some clear set of directives, there were so many choices, it took me a long time to grow up, and that consequently caused problems for me with relationships. Um, I had a certain type of woman that I always went after, and that was women who wanted little or nothing to do with me. <laughs> oh, oh, that really got me going. <laughs> I think because I had seen too many movies, you know what I mean? I was taking my cue from movies that I'd seen. Like, well, this young lady seems to care little whether I live or die. I think we're about to fall in love. <laughs> Did that for a long time. And finally, it all came to a head. My masterpiece in this relationship medium was I fell in love with a very close female friend of mine. It was like I woke up one day and said, what is the absolute worst move I could make for my emotional life right now? One day, I couldn't take it anymore, and I had to declare my love for her. It was very cinematic. <laughs> and I was thinking, I guess, well, we're probably going to go to a train platform and kiss under a big clock. <laughs> well, it turns out she was not watching the same movies I was watching. And my declaration of love was met with anger and feelings of betrayal. And that made the friendship a little tense for a while. <laughs> Friendship limped along for another year, just got more and more tense, and then eventually she couldn't take any more of my weird man anger. I'm sure there's a lot of women in this room who've had this experience in their lives of a male friend of theirs who seems to get very mad when you do things without him. Like, oh, uh, I was free that night. I don't know why uh, you couldn't call me to go to that movie. <laughs> I mean, I thought we were supposed to be friends. <laughs> so eventually I just pushed it too far, and she cut me out of her life entirely. I was devastated, devastated. At that point in my life, the way I was dealing with emotional troubles was every Friday I would go to this nightclub called Largo and I would stand at the back of the bar and I would get blind drunk. <laughs> this was a great system for a while. <laughs> so one night, right after my friend has cut me out of her life forever, one night I'm at Largo and I'm drunk and I'm standing there at the bar and I'm thinking, I am sad. I'm very sad. I don't know what to do or what I am doing. 
at this point, my friend, the bartender, Ellen, Ellen is telling me this story, this very sweet, touching story about a little boy in her neighborhood. This story has nothing to do with relationships. It has nothing to do with me. <laughs> but as she's telling this story, my eyes start to sting, and I get a catch in my throat, and I realize, uh-oh, <laughs> you are about to start crying in public. <laughs> you gotta get out of here. <laughs> So I ran out into the alley behind the club. I sit down on this crate, and it all just starts coming out of me. Years of just stupid decisions and not knowing what to do. I start crying so hard. It is like I am scream weeping at the asphalt. <laughs> like, it's like I'm throwing up sadness out of my eyes. Just projectile weeping. Just huge racking sobs like, I don't know how to live life. <laughs> So a couple moments later, my friend Ellen comes out. She says, oh my God, I saw you ran out. Are you okay? She puts her arm around me. And she just holds me for a while and lets me cry. And then gradually, I get a hold of myself. And she says, are you going to be okay? And I say, yeah, I think so. Thank you so much. She goes, okay. I'm going to go back inside. Just so you know, there's a guy over there. <laughs> She goes back inside, and I looked, and there was a guy over there. <laughs> Just a dude who had stepped out for a smoke, saw this total stranger run out of the bar, sit down, and start full of crying. <laughs> so I look up at this guy, my red tear streak face, and I say, hey. <laughs> And this guy, God bless him, this guy, total stranger, says to me, you want a hug? <laughs> it's a good old world, ladies and gentlemen. It is a good old world. So I said to this nice man, I said, no, I'm good, but thank you very much. I think I'm, I'm going to be okay. Thank you. And he said, you want to get high? <laughs> He kind of took the shine off the moment there. <laughs> I appreciate the offer. But uh, getting blind drunk all the time doesn't seem to be doing anything. So I think that um, uh, embarking on a marijuana career would be a lateral move at best. <laughs> I think it is time to bring in the pros! And that is when I started going to therapy. Now, I don't want to talk about therapy any more than you want to hear me talk about it. <laughs> I'll keep this very brief. I hate when people are too open about their therapy. And it's not that therapy is a shameful thing, it's that it's private. It's private. I don't like when people just go on and on like, yeah, my shrink says, ugh. I don't think your shrink is trying to get messages to me through you. Okay? Also, next time, listen a little closer because you're still a monster. I made myself go to therapy. I was terrified to go to therapy. I'd never been before. I didn't know what to expect. And I was not raised in a culture that encouraged the acknowledgement of problems, much less the addressing of them. <laughs> the culture in which I was raised was more like, you think there's something wrong with you? Oh, I think there's something wrong with you. <laughs> so I screwed up my courage, went to therapy, and very quickly realized, oh, this is a good thing. This is just about figuring things out. Why do you do the things that you do? How can you stop making the same mistakes that you always make? It was great. I did not turn out to be a secret sociopath or whatever it was I was afraid of. <laughs> it's a very useful tool. So if you're having problems, I recommend giving therapy a try. It has nothing to be ashamed of. It's a very practical thing to do. And listen, it, it's good. It's not all about blaming your parents for stuff. There's enough of that, though, that you feel like you're getting your money's worth. <laughs> So after years of working on myself and figuring stuff out, I eventually meet the woman that I'm going to marry. And I recognize her as not just someone that I am attracted to, but also as a fundamentally decent person who recognizes me as sane. That's really all you need when you come right down to it. Find someone you like to look at 
Who doesn't hate you? <laughs> my wife is from a place called Sullivan's Island, South Carolina. It's one of my favorite places on earth. It is a little beach community near Charleston, South Carolina. First time she took me to that place, I fell in love with it immediately. Took me to the beach. We parked at a place called the Sand Dunes Club. She said, that's the Sand Dunes Club. It is a private function hall for employees of the South Carolina Electric Company. Now, I have checked this, and I have double-checked this, and it checks out. <laughs> this is true. And yet, how can that be true, right? <laughs> how are the employees of the South Carolina Electric Company having so many parties <laughs> that at some point someone said, yo, we need a dedicated space? <laughs> I mean, this is nuts. <laughs> Will I see you at the Sand Dunes Club this evening? Party season is open. <laughs> All manner of electrical people will be there. <laughs> Take care to wear your rubber sole tuxedo. I hear tell they have a punch bowl filled with lightning. <laughs> Here's my favorite Sullivan's Island story. Years ago, in the 80s, I believe, there was a doctor on Sullivan's Island who had in his garage, he had a big freezer chest full of stuff, like the things that you would have in your garage freezer chest like some baits or steaks for the grill. Or, in this guy's case, human remains. <laughs> it was the 80s. <laughs> I don't think people question things the way they do now. <laughs> yeah, well, he's a doctor. That's why he must need that. <laughs> Are you a doctor? Well, that's why you don't have body parts in your freezer. <laughs> Amongst this gentleman's specimens was an amputated child's foot. Just wait. <laughs> One day, this doctor suffers a power failure at his home, and all of his treasures are in danger of spoiling in the garage. But this doctor, he's a real lemons into lemonadezer. <laughs> he said, I will take this opportunity to study the ligaments of the human foot. As he later explained to authorities, <laughs> He put the amputated child's foot into a crab trap and lowered the crab trap into the ocean, assuming that the crabs would devour the hard parts of the human foot, but leave the delicate ligaments intact for later study. <laughs> this is why we call crabs the surgeons of the sea. <laughs> Were you wondering where that expression came from? Now you know. Well, wouldn't you know it? Well, that old foot done got out of that darn crab trap. <laughs> it washes up on the beach of Sullivan's Island, and people lose their minds. <laughs> because they think a maniac is loose shopping up children. A manhunt is called. After a few hours of frenzied search, eventually this doctor has to step forward and say, um, yeah, um... <laughs> I might gotta put that foot in a crab trap. <laughs> yeah, those crabs, they let me down this time. <laughs> Postscript, this doctor was allowed to keep his medical license because it is Sullivan's Island and who among us hasn't put a metaphorical amputated child's foot into a figurative crab trap at one point or another. <laughs> so that's where she's from. So she married me, even though, at the time of our marriage, the age of 41, I still did not have a driver's license. Yeah, I know. I'm real weirdo. You should judge. <laughs> I always had just a fear block about it. It seemed impossible to me. When I was a teenager and my friends were getting their driver's license, I'm like, what is everyone doing? <laughs> like, the, I, the amount of things that you had to remember in order to make a car go and not kill anyone? It seemed an impossible amount to me. I was like a medieval peasant about it, like, oh ho, you will not catch me entering the belly of that iron dragon. <laughs> and I grew up in Philadelphia where you could reasonably get around without a car. Sometimes I had to bum rides, which was mortifying, but it did give me a chance to hone my self-loathing skills. <laughs> Always, I could say, well, I hate myself for my fear, I hate myself for my lack of independence, 
This is what being a late bloomer is really all about. <laughs> then I moved to Los Angeles, where everything became exponentially more difficult, right? Like, I knew kind of that Los Angeles was a car culture. I didn't know that you just had to have a car. You just have to have a car. When I first got here, I started taking the bus places, and then very quickly realized, oh, that simply isn't done. <laughs> I tell people I took the bus and they would say, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you mean you took the bus? <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I understand the phrase, but not in like a life context. <laughs> Were you researching a role? <laughs> so then after I got a good paying sh showbiz job, I started taking cabs everywhere. And what cabs had over buses is that they were a thousand times more expensive and a million times more unreliable. <laughs> Here's what they're great at, keeping those self-loathing fires stoked at all times. Because in Los Angeles, you can't just stick your hand in the air and hail a cab. It, it's not what you do. You have to call a cab company and ask them to send a cab over to you. Like, if you were to walk out and try to hail a cab in Los Angeles, the cab would think it was weird. <laughs> like, the cab driver would say, is that guy trying to hail a cab? <laughs> I'm a cab. <laughs> In Los Angeles, you have to call a cab company up, much like a child asking for their parents to pick them up from a place. Hello, cab company. Can you come get me? I'm not a real grown-up. I'm just like a big baby in a man suit. The switch got flipped in my brain, and I realized, no, I can do this. I am capable of this. This is not beyond me. Surely, I am a smart as the dumbest person I know who drives a car. <laughs> Called up a driving school. So they sent me an instructor, and this guy was every nightmare I had about the situation. Absolutely. This guy is so used to dealing with kids, he's talking to me that way. And it's having the same effect on me, a grown man, as it would have on a 60-year-old. He's barking orders. First of all, we go into traffic. Like, I didn't realize that would be part of the test the first day. How do you think we start with being in traffic? What did I think was going to happen? Like, I thought he was going to take me to a supermarket, and I'd just drive around in circles, and then they give me a diploma? It's like, we pull out into traffic, and I'm internally losing it. I'm like, whoa, 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 what's happening? What's happening now? And he's just barking orders like, turn left, go over there, put that linker on, go there, slow down, speed up, all that shit. I'm losing my mind. So eventually, after I make the millionth mistake, he goes, all right, pull over. I pull over, and he says, okay. What'd you do wrong? <laughs> All right, what, I, I actually think I'm older than you, so that cannot continue. <laughs> you can't do a what did you do wrong with me. Also, if I had known what I was doing wrong, then I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but I would have done the right things instead of the wrong things. I'm not an eccentric millionaire <laughs> who's testing driving instructors. <laughs> Oh, 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 you have passed my driving exam. <laughs> Here are the keys to my driving university. <laughs> what I do wrong? I'm 41 years old and I'm in a car with two steering wheels. How far back do you want to go? <laughs> so then I did something very uncharacteristic of me, but very grown up and very mature. I called the driving school up and I requested a different instructor. It's like, oh, that's a thing that I could do, right? I could do that. I called him up and said, yes, I would like a new instructor, please. I would like someone to address my specific needs. Yes, I am a, a shame-based and fear-filled. <laughs> I would like him to take that into account. He must be kind. He must be understanding. I was practically reciting the list from Mary Poppins. Right? <laughs> he must give sweets and never cross. <laughs> So then they sent me Edgar, an angel, straight from heaven. <laughs> Edgar understood. Edgar got it. He's very kind and very patient. At one point, I was so frustrated. I was having such a hard time with all the myriad sliding doors possibilities of stop signs. <laughs> Kept forgetting what the right thing to do was in the right situation. And Edgar could see it. And Edgar said, I understand you are frustrated. You are like me. You are in a hurry to know it already. Well, I could have cried like I was sitting on a crate in an alley.
can't, Edgar. I don't like you. <laughs> Edgar, instruct me to drive to a park and we'll throw a ball back and forth and you'll be my new dad. <laughs> So Edgar helped me get my driver's license. But you know who really helped me was my wife. I could not have done that without her support. First of all, she took me my word when I said, when we got together, it was a serious relationship. And I said, one day I will learn how to drive a car. She believed me. And I think she believed it for me for a while. And then eventually it came true. I was so proud that I could do this. And I was so grateful to my wife. And that day that I went for my driving test, I was excited. Despite the fact that many of my friends told me, hey, listen, before you take a driving test, just know, if you don't pass, it's not a big deal. I had to take my test like six times before I passed. Okay, let's not reinforce failure quite so strongly. <laughs> do this. Also, not for nothing, I bet that adult me is smarter than kid you. <laughs> and adult you. <laughs> So I go take that test, boom, ace it. First time out, I now have a license to drive. I go to get my driver's license photo taken, and I'm excited. So many people I know hate their driver's license picture, and I'm like, oh, that's not going to be me. I'm going to look sharp in my driver's license picture. I'm going to love showing that thing around. Shut up to that driving test, suit and tie, ready to go. Walk up, slam a piece of paper down. I'm ready to take my driver's license photo, please. <laughs> Guy behind the counter says, we already have your picture. I'm like, oh, I beg your pardon? <laughs> <laughs> When did this mysterious photo shoot take place? Uh, was I awake? Are you aware my home is a private residence? The guy said, we took your picture when you did the written test. The written test. Then, like, at, at the end of a thriller, everything's going backwards, like, where was I coming from when I took the written test? Get this thing in the mail. I took the written test on the way back from the gym. I'm all shiny and sweaty, my bedhead. Wearing a hoodie. Me. Me! <laughs> Sick me. Sick me. <laughs> oh, man. The, the worst part of it is, this is the thing you have to show more than anything to say, this is who I am. <laughs> Would it kill one official to just pretend that it doesn't look like me. Like, just once at the airport, just somebody say, oh, oh sir, this, uh, there's been an obvious uh, mistake here. I think you're the victim of some sort of Prince and the Pauper scheme. Uh, some almost good-looking vagrant has switched identities with you. We'll find the scoundrel. Why don't you wait here in our obvious gentleman's lounge? <laughs> My wife and I were getting together. There's always these points in a relationship where you are discovering things about each other, and some of those things are weird, but they're not deal breakers. You know what I mean? They're tolerable weirdnesses that you say, oh, that's, that's odd. That's not the way that I am, but um, <laughs> it's not getting in the way, so fine. I want to tell you a story about a night where my wife and I discovered weird things about each other. There's this place here in Los Angeles called the Magic Castle. Please, please, let us not clap for buildings. People only. People outrank buildings every time. The Magic Castle is a private club for magicians. This is a true thing that I have just said to you. A private club for magicians, and it is a place where magicians can go to not get beat up, presumably. <laughs> And Magic Castle is a more elegant name than Magic Fort. <laughs> the Magic Castle is private. The only way you can enter the Magic Castle is if you are a magician, which you aren't. <laughs> or if you are friends with a magician, which you are not. <laughs> However, there is totally a magical loophole. If you stay at the nearby Magic Castle Hotel, you get four passes to the Magic Castle. The reason I know this is because whenever my wife would have out-of-town guests coming to visit, she would recommend that they stay at the Magic Castle Hotel. I would hear her on the phone. She would say, oh, yeah, you should stay. When you come here, you should stay at the Magic Castle Hotel. You get four passes to the Magic Castle, and we can all go together. 
Now you have to understand, I had never heard this woman express any interest in magic whatsoever. <laughs> never. I never caught her looking out a window, sighing, saying, oh, I wish magic was happening right now. <laughs> so this was strange. I didn't know what was going on. After about the fifth time I heard her do this, I finally said to her, hey, honey, why do you want to go to the magic castle so badly? Her head whipped around, and she said, because it's exclusive. <laughs> about was that she wasn't allowed in this place. <laughs> the end. She didn't care about magic. That place could have been called the murder castle. <laughs> oh, no one tells me what castles I can and cannot enter. I'll break your walls, magic castle. You just see if I don't. Eventually, she convinces her own father to stay at the magic castle. He gets the fourth mountain, and guess what? We're going to the magic castle. <laughs> We got all dressed up because the Magic Castle has a very strict dress code. Men must wear a coat and tie. Women must wear whatever it is women need to wear to not get kicked out of the place. <laughs> now, I know this because a friend of mine went to the Magic Castle and did not pass muster. My friend was wearing a coat and tie and black jeans that if you did not look too closely, you would think were black dress pants. Well, they do look that closely. <laughs> My friend was told, I'm sorry, we cannot admit, sir, in those dungarees. <laughs> my friend turned to his party and said, well, sorry, guys, I guess I'll have to go home. The guy at the Magic Castle said, well, that will not be necessary. We have trousers for sir. <laughs> this was not their first pair of black jeans at the Magic Castle. <laughs> These guys have gone beyond house tie and house jacket, and they now have house pants. <laughs> my friend said they had three sizes, small, medium, and large. He's a thin guy, but he's tall, so we went with the medium, which fit okay in the waist, but only came up to about two <laughs> Just kind of mid cough My question is, is that really better, Magic Castle? <laughs> is that preserving the air of elegance for which you strive? Are there two members seeing my friend across the room saying, oh, I could stare at that gentleman's shin bones all night? <laughs> Thank heavens he isn't wearing denim, the least magical of fabrics. <laughs> so we, go, we get all dressed up, and we are going to make a night of it at the Magic Castle. We're going to have dinner, drinks, and see what they call the big show. So we get there, hit the bar, drinks on an empty stomach. All right, Magic Castle, let's do this. <laughs> go have dinner. Drink during dinner, after dinner, big show, plenty of time till that starts. Let's have more of those drinks. <laughs> we are hammered, right? We're hammered. Now, as we're sitting there at the table, with our after dinner drinks, a guy comes up to us wearing a tuxedo, he's holding a camera, and he says, souvenir picture for the table? Now the weird thing my wife is about to find out about me is that I have a perverse love of being ripped off by touristy bullshit. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's hilarious to me. Like a guy comes in, closing time at a bar, rose for the lady. I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> I think it's that I know he's ripping me off. He knows he's ripping me off, but he doesn't know that I know he's ripping me off. Yeah, it's just the sickness. Yeah, I'll give you $10 for that half dead flower. Now who's getting ripped off? <laughs> That's right, still me. <laughs> so this guy walks up to us. Do you have a picture for that? He couldn't even finish it. Like, yes, how much? The guy says, $20 a person. <laughs> well, I could have hugged him. <laughs> this was outrageous. The sheer gall. <laughs> Thrilled. Hold on a second, sir. Before I hand you $80 for a photograph, may I ask this question? Will this be a wildly unflattering photo that I would never display in my home or office? Oh, it definitely will be? Brief follow up do you accept tips? So this guy takes our picture and says, all right, here's what's going to happen. 
right before the big show starts, I'm going to walk out onto the stage and I'm going to have everybody's pictures that I've taken tonight. And when you, I'm going to hold them all up, and when you see your picture, you yell out, Hocus Pocus Focus! <laughs> and I was like, dude, we are drunk, but we are not that drunk. <laughs> oh, let's have some more drinks. So we go down and see the big show, and it is nuts in there. We realize everyone has been on the same trajectory that we've been on. It's a bunch of people in their Sunday best, drunk out of their minds. People are just screaming and yelling. It's like a high school cafeteria in there. The show has not even started. People are just sitting in chairs. Ah! Adult. This guy comes out with the pictures? Pandemonium! Oh my god! People are screaming, hi, 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 hi. There are missed high fives and people are falling on the ground. I'm so excited because I got one in the chamber, right? I'm just waiting to see our picture. Finally, he holds it up and I yell out, Hocus Pocus, you sucked us for $80! I was a hero to the trumpet. That picture is displayed prominently in our home. It is one of our most prized possessions, like, first off the wall on the event of a fire. I love it. In that picture, you can see my wife's face. She has this huge smile on her face. She's so happy. And you can see in her smile just her love of life, her joy at discovering secret things, everything. All the reasons that I love her. And in my face, you can see that I am drunk and bad with money. There was a strange thing that I saw at the Magic Castle, which unsettled me. It took me a while to process what was happening. The Magic Castle is covered floor to ceiling with magical shit. <laughs> There's not a single square inch of space that is not encrusted with magic bric-a-brac. It is old props and wands and playbills, posters, all these portraits. There's a number of portraits of magicians, magicians from the past, magicians from the present, none from the future. <laughs> because it is the magic castle, not the science castle. <laughs> As we were waiting to be seated for dinner, standing there at this podium, I saw this oil painting. My eyes just like touched on it for a second, and instantly I knew there's something off about this, something unnatural and strange. I know you're going to say, Paul, uh, eye holes were cut out, real eyes were looking through the painting. No. <laughs> and may I say, opportunity missed, Magic Castle. <laughs> there should be real eyes coming out of so many paintings in that place. <laughs> no, I can't identify what is wrong with this painting. I'm looking at it and looking at it. What is it? What is it? I know on a molecular level there's something wrong about this painting. And then all of a sudden I see it, and then it's all I can see. It is a painting of this kindly, dignified-looking older gentleman. I would say from the look of his clothes, uh, it was painted in the late 60s, early 70s. And the look of the man himself, he was old, and I would say he was probably in his early 80s. And I'm looking at this painting, and all of a sudden it becomes very clear to me that the man in this painting is obviously wearing a toupee. <laughs> It's a painting. <laughs> what kind of a dick artist <laughs> sees an old man with a toupee walk into a studio and says, I paint the truth, sir! <laughs> My impressions will not corroborate that lie upon your head. <laughs> at it, the more I started to think, maybe it was the old man's fault, because having an oil portrait done, it's not a five-minute affair. It's not like getting a caricature done at a carnival, like, doo -doo -doo -doo, there you go, there's your oil painting. <laughs> you have to sit in the same position in the same clothes for weeks and weeks at a time. You would think, like, halfway through, the guy might be curious, like, hey, let's see how she's coming along. Oh, hey, um, can I talk to you for a second? Oh, boy. Oh, Oh dear, uh, look, 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 uh, look, I'm not trying to tell you how to do your job, son, but uh, um, can I ask a favor? Uh, 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 could you not make my hair look fake? Here's why I asked. Uh, oh, 
that or see, see, years from now when my, uh, when my uh, oil painting is hanging in my, uh, my guild's hall of fame, as it were, and, uh, uh, you know, people who are seeing me for the one and only time, just for a brief second, uh, the people who won't, won't know whether I truly lived or died, uh, <laughs> rather these uh, future generations, people yet to be, rather when they do see my uh, likeness, uh, the only time they will ever see it, uh, in my uh, guild's hall of fame, I'd rather that uh, the first thought not be, uh, Huh, wig. So I tell you what. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Tell you what, if I uh, make it worth your while, maybe uh, give you a couple extra hundred dollars, uh, perhaps you could help me achieve an illusion I was unable to achieve in life. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all.